Good morning, everybody. So a lot of the questions um, that were asked in the previous session, I'm going to hopefully address some of them relative to um, transportation infrastructure. And those, those were really good questions, and we did a lot of research on some of the things that were asked. So I'm going to get right into it. Um, I'm going to break this into two different pieces. The first piece, I want to talk about specifications at the bridge level. So what we did um, in Ashto to develop specifications for the use of, of FRP materials, whether it's fiber, you know, uh, carbon fiber, glass fiber, aramid, basalt, um, how we're using that in, in bridges, uh, how we're using that to design bridges, to strengthen bridges, um, basically trying to use this as a tool in our toolbox. Um, you know, all, the, all the, the 50 state bridge engineers, they have a problem, right? It's not just building bridges, but it's maintaining a network of bridges, and there's 670 some thousand bridges in the U.S. right now, and you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large problem to solve. Then I'm going to get into what we did when I was at the Michigan DOT in terms of research and implementation of projects using FRP. So in, in 2018, uh, we drastically updated the guide for uh, GFRP specifications. So GFRP is not something that I used personally a lot in Michigan, but it's used in coastal states, it's used in southern states. Um, and, and again, it's a very good tool in the toolbox. And the previous specification was, was very limited. It was limited to bridge decks. It was limited to, you know, the, the, the arching uh, action of bridge decks, flexural failure, stuff like that. So we took a, a deep dive into that. First, it had to be updated to the LRFD. It was the old LFD specifications. Uh, so it was updated uh, for the LRFD, uh, included flexural members, uh, substructure elements, um, and compression members. And then we started to get into the difference in how these materials affect creep of the concrete and then the fatigue of the materials themselves, and that's all covered um, in the, the guide specification. The cool thing about when you put out a guide specification is as soon as somebody uses it, they find you missed something, which is a good sign, right? It means that somebody's using it. And so within a year, uh, we, had a, we had a resistance factor that was being questioned by some practitioners, and we took it back, the, the, the T6 committee, we took it back and we looked at it and we said, yep, you know what, you're right. And so we issued some guidance and we bumped something from 0.65 to, uh, to 0.7. So that's always a good, you know, the, the code writing bodies um, and the practitioners, that's why you always have to have a good mix of, of folks because you, you need the academic part to actually write the specifications, but then there has to be an end user and that end user has to find them find them useful. So the big one that we worked on for a number of years, and uh, this started as an NCHRP, we wrote, a, we wrote an NCHRP research needs statement back 2015, I think, something like that, 2014. It, it was an NCHRP report that then we took it and turned it into an AASHTO guide specification, and this was using um, the, the high strength materials, the CFRP, for pre-stressing, okay? So, like Harry talked about before, when, when we're dealing with concrete elements, we really want to take advantage of pre-stressing and post-tensioning, and that's where I see a, a huge application of FRP. And so we took a holistic approach. We said, okay, we, we know we've got this ASTM A416 steel strand, and we love it because you pull it, you pour concrete around it, you release the strands, you pre-compress the concrete, you pre-compress it to some you know, uh, load that you know, your service load gets zero tension in the bottom flange. How can we do that with FRP knowing, like Kerry talked about before, it's a brittle material. There is no yield plateau, so you have to rethink how you're going to use these materials in a flexural condition or in a condition where, for example, in a bridge beam, you want high deflections, right? You want to see that thing deflect. You do not want a sudden brittle failure. So how do you do that? So we wrote out a whole research uh, program. Dr. Balarbi from the University of Houston was the PI. He did, he did a great job over This took us four years. Um, and so when we started getting into looking at the actual equations, right, everything that we do in AASHTO is based on deflections and, you know, we want things to be tension controlled. As you heard from Kerry previously, with FRP, compression controlled actually is, is not a bad way to go because you go with a lower resistance factor, you, you, you back down your capacity, and, and you go from there, and then you, you set the geometry of your, your element to that. So we took a, we took a hard look at what the, um, what the strength needed to be. Right? You've, got this, you've got this material that's got extremely high tensile strength, but there's a whole bunch of factors that you have to worry about. You have to worry about creep rupture. 
Creep rupture is something that FRP, uh, something you don't have to worry about for steel, right? Creep rupture is in a brittle element under sustained loading, it will fail over time. It's just a matter of time. It's a guarantee it's going to fail. So you never want to stress it above a certain limit. You've got environmental factors, and you've got all these different factors that you have to worry about. So what we did was we, we did a, a lot of testing, and I'm going to get into this more when we talk about um, what we did in Michigan. But we did a lot of testing of different levels of when you, when you take a CFRP strand and you, stress, and you stress it, what levels of stress can you get to to guarantee that during the service life of the bridge, try to interpolate it out to one million hours, how can you, assure, how can you reasonably assure that there's no probability of, seed, of exceeding that creep rupture limit, right? So we don't want to stress it all the way to where yeah, it's going to handle the loads during the first 50 years of its life, but then at some point you're going to have creep rupture. So ACI 440 uh, does a nice job of dealing with creep ruptures. So, so does the, um, there's, a, there's a Japanese standard that does a nice job. So we started there, and then we kind of backed down, and we said, okay, 0.8 is going to be our upper, upper limit, but we're not even going to go there. We went to 0.7 for cables and then 0.65. So that's what we will stress them to, to guarantee. So 0.7 FPU is what we can stress it to, to guarantee that we're gonna stay below that creep rupture limit during the life of the bridge. And, and what we did because there were, so at the time when I was with MDOT, we had already done a bunch of pre-stressed uh, beam bridges, pre-stressed with CFRP. We had a comfort level, we developed our own specifications, but the theoretical discussion between compression controlled and tension controlled sections was always something that we struggled with. And so what we ended up doing with the code for the Ashto code was we said, okay, we're gonna proportion the materials such that it doesn't matter whether you're compression controlled or tension controlled, we're gonna go with a 0.75 resistance factor for both. The reason being is this, if you look at when you design a pre-stress beam with steel, you take all the layers of steel and you find the centroid and then that moment arm is from the centroid of the beam to the center of your centroid of your steel, right? Because it's going to yield, the steel is going to yield. The same cannot be said about carbon fiber pre-stressing. If you look at the diagram here, you've got three separate rows. Each one of those rows is going to fail separately. Okay, so the, the bottom row, obviously, that's going to be in the most extreme stain. That, the strain. That is going to fracture, and then the load is going to go up and up and up until you get failure of the beam. So the key is to proportion the CFRP in the pre-stressed beam so that you get that failure mode where it, it kind of like opens up like a zipper, but you're going to get tons and tons of deflection prior to that happening. Okay, it's a pseudo-ductal behavior, and I'll show you a cool video of um, tests that we did in the Lawrence Tech Lab. Uh, that shows how much this stuff deflects. So the fundamental difference here is we are not, we're not having any difference between whether it's tension controlled or compression controlled. We're going to use a resistance factor of 0.75 for both. Again, this is the Ashto code. ACI does it a little bit differently, but this is how we simplified it for Ashto and for practitioners. And then what we just finished um, and what we took to ballot last year um, at the Ashto Committee on Bridges and Structures was the update to the FRP strengthening guide specification, which for me as a former owner, using this is really a game changer for an owner, okay? To be able to use, and, and what you saw carry, with, with how they strengthened that building by cutting the ridges in and doing near surface mounted carbon fiber, the same, we do the same thing on bridges. We do even more. We do wrapping, we do confinement. As, as a bridge owner, having a useful specification on how FRP can be used to strengthen and retrofit bridges is a game changer. And the 2012 spec, um, again, users found it to be kind of clunky. There, was, there were divisions between, okay, when, when there's no Ashto guidance, then just fall back on ACI. And it was kind of, you know, it, it wasn't very useful to, to practitioners. So we went ahead and had a project. Uh, Dr. Harik from the University of Kentucky did an amazing job. And um, between him and our committee, we updated the guide specifications to include all of these things here that weren't in it before. So analysis and strengthening of flange sections and failure, pre stress concrete, all of these things on here now are included. And then we included some comprehensive examples for designers um, in the back. We set a, a, an effective FRP concrete interface strain at 0 .005, um, which again, previously, the previous uh, guide specification, it took it sometimes all the way down to what you want your strain in concrete to be, which was 0 0.003. 
I thought that was artificially low, right? It was really limiting. You ended up having to use 14 layers of, of bonded FRP just to achieve a strength, okay? We added some environmental factors. This is something that we wanted owners to be able to, to, to use. So if you're in a highly uh, acidic environment or sulfuric environment or on a coastal, uh, you know, a coastal structure, uh, you're going to have a lower environmental factor, whereas if you're in an arid type of a situation, you can have a higher factor. And we gave some guidance to bridge owners to say, this is what we recommend, but it's here if you want to use it, okay? We also did that for bond as well. Um, we updated the strain values for anchorages. Sometimes it, bond alone is not enough to develop the strength of, let's say you're using a, a, a U-wrap for shear strengthening. Bond alone is not an option sometimes, especially when you're dealing with a pre-stressed concrete I-beam or an Ashto stubby I that has um, corners and edges, um, sometimes bond is not enough. So we, we dealt with the anchorage issue. We also look, we did some testing on development length of the actual sheets themselves of the, of the strengthening to prevent debonding and we gave some guidance as to how far past do you, um, you know, do you develop your, your strengthening regime past your point of contraflexure if you're in a continuous situation or when your moment drops to zero where you have low stress. And then we put a lot of emphasis again on the anchoring and how you can lay out the anchoring. Uh, we put provisions in there about using a pachometer to test for reinforcement and, and all of that stuff. Um, and, and, this is, and this is real. So again, if you see you got a pre-stressed I-beam shape there, it's very hard when you're putting a, a wrap on uh, to have bond be the true solution to developing your strength, right? Especially when we know if you're using bond, there's, there's really, really rigorous surface preparation requirements, which are you're reliant on the designer is blindly reliant on contractors' preparation, and then if you have a construction inspector, are they holding them to the surface prep requirements, the you know, SSPC surface prep requirements per the specification? So there's a lot of things that could go wrong when you're using bond only, so we focused a lot on being able to anchor. We included the near surface mount um, specifications as well. That's what you saw in, in Carrie's uh, presentation when they were strengthening that building floor. And again, I, that's a, we balloted it last year and the, the picture in the upper right, that's actually what the new uh, specification, it's in the Ashto bookstore now. Okay? So that's what's been done at a national level. Uh, I'll talk a, a little closer to home in terms of what we did, my time at MDOT, uh, to use FRP materials. And we, we were keenly interested in it in Michigan uh, for the reason of corrosion. We have a population of bridges in Michigan, uh, con pre-stressed concrete beam bridges that were built in the late 50s, early 60s, where almost all of them now, if you look at the bearing, uh, you've got corrosion of the strands uh, at the bearing, you've got bottom spalling. Uh, we've got a whole population of pre-stressed concrete box beams that only have about an inch of cover to the strand and that bottom flange spalls and these are bridges that we have to replace or you know they're tough to repair. You know, so using a, a non-corrosive material was, was very, very beneficial to us. So the, but but we, we took some baby steps. So I'm talking, I'm going back to the mid-2000s. Um, I was project manager on a bridge replacement project where we were taking an old steel beam bridge and just putting a pre-stressed box beam bridge back and I thought, well, if we're going to do that, I want to post-tension those beams together and I'm going to try, try with carbon fiber. I'm going to try to post-tension with carbon fiber. And so we designed traditional steel pre-stressed box beams. Uh, we put them together and we developed a system. We used a system developed by uh, Tokyo Rope at the time um, to thread post-tensioning tendons into the beam and then uh, post-tension them. And the, and the interesting thing you heard in the previous presentation about how do you stress these things, right? You can't just, uh, in a steel strand, you put the chuck on and you pull. You cannot do that with, carb with any fiber material. You're going to crush the end of it and then you're not going to be able to stress it. So how do you couple the materials so that you can stress them? We had to develop all of that. So here we are, we got, so the bridge is installed, the beams are installed, and we threaded through the post-tensioning tendon, and what we did was we put a large stainless steel cap on it. So the, the, the tendon itself is potted into this large stainless steel cap, and you 
pour some highly expansive grout, and that causes it to lock into place. And then we thread that through the fascia bead, and then we actually uh, pull, just like a normal post-tensioning operation. You have a hollow core jack. You can see our jacking chair. Pull it out to the required elongation. Spin your lock nut down. On the dead end, we had some, uh, some load cells uh, so we could verify the load. And those are still uh, wired um, and transmit data to this day because we wanted to see how the load would change through the seasons. On the bridge deck itself, we used, uh, this is a product uh, from Canada. It's called NEFMAC. It's a grid, six by eight sheets. Uh, and it's a carbon fiber grid. So here you can see they're, they're you know, again, traditional beams, the, you know, traditional epoxy coated shear stirrups. And then we're using this NEFMAC grid and tying it all together. We had to write some provisions that you couldn't stand on it uh, during, you know, during the construction. So they had some sheets of wood that they would put over it. But uh, installation went real quick on this. We wired in some, some strain gauges and stuff like that. So we're still monitoring uh, how this is performing as well. Here's our just regular vibrating wire strain gauges. And here's some of our data. And it's exactly what we wanted to see. We've got load in the transverse post-tensioning. And the variations are due to thermal gradient through the different seasons. But otherwise, uh, this bridge has been out there since 2011. Uh, and it's been operating just fine. And there it is. And see here, you can see where the post-tensioning comes out right there. Uh, so that's a little bit different, right? With steel post tension, you usually have a, a grout pocket, and you lock it in place, you lock the plate in, and then you, you grout over it. In this case, because we had to have that long stainless steel uh, anchor, it comes out of the fascia beam, but then we have a cap in there, and again, no corrosive materials. We used the stainless steel anchor, carbon fiber tendon. We did not have to grout the duct. So it is an ungrouted post tension system, and again, working great to this day. So that worked really well. I wanted to find another bridge to do it on. So we were going to replace this railroad bridge. This is in the middle of the state. This is in Jackson, Michigan. Same thing. Now here is, you can see a, a better example of what this thing looks like. So here's the tendon right here. Here's your stainless steel anchorage. We designed an anchor base plate. And then here is the cap. The, the stainless steel anchorage has a threaded rod that comes out. That's what actually gets gripped by the hollow core ram to stress it. This is what, what gets gripped, stressed. You lock the nut down, and you lock the force in place. Okay. And this is the bridge here. Again, it's just a, uh, it's a traditional side-by-side -side box beam bridge, pretty shallow box beams as well, 21 inches. And the uh, box beams actually follow the crown of the roadway. There's a 2% crown on the road. And so that, that made it interesting because you're threading a whole, you know, a whole tendon through even though the beams are crowned. So we had to be very careful how the beam pockets were manufactured to make sure everything went in okay. And here's the tendons as they come to the site. Uh, so we had in our, our special provisions that they had to be well protected. These carbon fiber materials uh, are very uh, susceptible to any sort of mechanical abrasion that can really affect their performance. You can actually, uh, during stressing, you can lose individual strands if they're nicked. So here they are on site. They're, they're taking good care of them. Carbon fiber materials are pretty light. So it just took a couple of iron workers to kind of lift them into uh, the transverse post-tensioning conduit. So here they are. They've got them all installed. Here's the jacking chair that we, we devised. And they're hooking it up to the stainless steel anchorage. And then we uh, stressed to about 150 kips because we wanted to put about 200 PSI of compression into, into the beams and the bridge deck itself. So like any, uh, any DOT or any agency that uses uh, state and federal funds, we have to do material certifications and those follow the, follow the, the, the bridge during its entire life. So the manufacture of this at the time uh, was done in Japan. And so uh, we sent an inspector over there to actually witness the testing um, and then sign an affidavit. And you can see here, um, this is your failure. There is no yield plateau. It goes right to ultimate, and then it fractures. Okay, And that was exactly what we, we needed it to be. 
So those are what the material certifications look like that sit in the, you know, sit in the project files to this day. And again, I, we wrote a, a, just a simple MathCAD here on for each increment of load. We wanted to make sure because the contractor had never used this stuff before. Okay? The contractor was not sure how to post tension carbon fiber. And so we generated a table for them in, 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 in increments of, of 10 kips. 10 kips, stop the jack, spin the lock ring, check your deflection or check your elongation, right? And we did that uh, up, to the, up to the 150 kip limit and made sure that we were within a couple of percent of the anticipated elongations had to be within a couple of percent of the actual elongations and everything, uh, everything worked fine. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get into, so I'm gonna get into some of the technical pieces of some of the questions that were asked last time about you know, how did we develop the code here? And so this is a lot of the work that uh, Dr. DeBeal Grace and I did at, at Lawrence Tech. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to say, okay, we're designing a pre-stressed beam, but we can still use Ashto where we know Ashto works, and then we just have to fill in the blanks where Ashto doesn't work, right? So we know that, you know, Ashto requires an initial jacking force. We have a pre-stressing force uh, before and after a transfer, right? Okay, so these are all things that we know from the code, right? We have to take into account instantaneous elastic shortening. And then we have to take into account our effective pre-stress or the long-term losses. That is where we focus most of our work because it's well documented what happens to low relaxation strands, steel strands. It's not well documented what happens to carbon fiber strands over 25 years and 50 years. And what kind of losses do those develop? And so that was the focus of a lot of our, of our research. Instantaneous losses, this is right out of Ashto. So we can use that. It's a function of your beam geometry, your beam section, uh, your eccentricity. So nothing unique here, whether you're designing with steel or carbon fiber. Where we got into the differences is the long-term losses due to carbon fiber. And that is where we really had to do a lot of testing. We had to require a lot of information from different manufacturers and we had to come up with some sort of value for this loss long term, okay? Check the stresses at the service limit state. So you're checking your top and bottom stresses. Pretty much the same type of thing you would do whether it was steel or carbon fiber. Same, same, type, of, same type of analysis that you're gonna do. The big difference when we started was Ashto at the um, at release and at long term allows for an allowable tension in your bottom flange. Okay, it's very small. It ends up being two, three hundred psi in a well-designed beam. But I wasn't comfortable with that, knowing that okay, there's still some tension that can develop. What would that do to a carbon fiber strand? So we balanced our equation by setting those to zero. And there is. There's been a lot of work that has been done, even Dr. Bellarby's work, that suggests you can still allow a little bit of tension. And honestly, as an owner, I would be comfortable with it now because even if there is a little bit of tension and even if there is some um, uh, even minor, not, not that you ever want to crack in a pre-stressed beam, but even if there's a crack, you have a material that is not going to corrode, okay? But again, we're talking baby steps here. We're talking, I'm gonna, design and build a bridge that's going to be out there for 100 years and I'm going to drive across it and my family's going to drive across it. I got to, I got to take baby steps with a new material and make sure it's going to be safe. So when we did our first initial designs, when we, when we set our, uh, when we had to figure out what pre-stressing was needed, we set our allowable tension to zero. Okay. Compression was fine. And then, again, this is the debate about the tension-controlled or compression-controlled section. We wanted to proportion our beam so that we stayed within either the, the bridge deck itself, which is difficult, or within the top flange of the beam, which is, which is more common. So that, th those were our parameters. We, we, we had to stay in that area. So then we started some testing. Okay, so for a steel strand, we know what that behavior looks like, right? Go up, linear, you got your yield plateau, and then you have failure. Carbon fiber, not so much. Linear until failure. We love, as designers, to stay below here, right? 
How do we do that? That was for a 0.6 inch strand. 0.7 is really, I think, kind of the future. Higher strength. So here's, here's a steel strand, okay? So you can see your nice yield plateau, and then here's your carbon fiber strand, okay? And here's what they all look like together. So obviously, if I'm looking to maximize my design as an owner, I want to go with, number one, the 0.7 inch, whether it's steel or carbon fiber. And if I'm really looking for zero corrosion alternate, I'm going to go with carbon fiber. And we actually have guidelines. We wrote some guidelines. Um, for example, in Michigan, if we have a, a, an urbanized area where you can get um, you know, environmental issues, carboniz carbonization of the concrete due to the industry in the area, or just average daily traffic, if I'm going to build a bridge that if I have to take a lane to rehab that bridge at any given time, there's a huge user delay cost. And any time you set up a work zone on a bridge, you create a safety situation. I'm going to try to have as few rehab cycles as possible. And honestly, wh why do we rehab bridges, especially bridge decks? Why do we get spalling and holes in bridge decks? Steel corrosion, typically, right? So if I can eliminate that, I'm going to try it. So here's all the sections that we, that we looked at, rectangular, flanged, compression, tension controlled. And so th this, is, this is what I was speaking about earlier, about how we have to be careful how we proportion the materials, because the material failure is based on its distance from the neutral axis. We cannot group everything into a center of gravity of strands and then take the moment arm from the neutral axis of the beam to that strand center of gravity. Okay? So it's a failure of each individual layer. And so your strain, you have a, you have a bunch of strains that you're going to sum up. Okay? And the strain level is going to be different for each row. Your force level may have to be different for each row as well. So we came up with this equivalent area of reinforcement ratio. Okay? And then we want to make sure we have a balanced you know, strain condition, balanced section. These are equations right out of ACI. And we want to make sure we have a tension failure. Calculate the depth of the neutral axis. And then you got it for a flange section and for a, a rectangular section. And then the strains in the individual layers. And where I'm going with this is we, we ended up um, developing tools for our designers on how to use all this. We don't expect. In, in, in a practical sense, we don't expect designers to do all of this research all the time. We want to give them practical tools. So here is your uh, nominal moment capacity uh, using the carbon fiber strands. And what we did was we developed a, uh, a library of MathCAD uh, sheets that uh, equations that are in there uh, are locked. You enter in your, your, your bridge geometry, and it'll run your analysis for you. Uh, but this was a, uh, a very in-depth, you know, MathCAD program that we developed that will design a bridge pre-stressed with carbon fiber strands. And it goes through all of the normal checks that you would do if it were a regular Ashto design. This, these are available on the uh, MDOT website, by the way. You can, you can download them and use them. And then it'll tell you what kind of section you have based on all of your geometry. And there's a flange section. Then it'll go into your nominal moment capacity, okay? So once we were comfortable with all that, we made the call, said, okay, let's go ahead and do a bridge that uses carbon fiber to pre-stress the beam. I was comfortable enough. We had done the research. We developed all these tools. So we selected a bridge. Uh, this is a bridge uh, in Detroit, Michigan. And it's spread box beams, so they're not side by side. We're not going to post tension them. But we're going to go ahead and pre-stress using carbon fiber strands, higher, higher tensile strength strands. And the, the, the procedure to get there is just like how you would do with Ashto, right? You assume a beam size. You have Ashto gives some span, you know, some span to depth ratio type things. You know, if you get 75 foot span, you're going to start with 0.004L as your, as your composite beam depth, right? So you start with a beam, you make a few assumptions about uh, you know, how many strands you're going to use, and then you calculate what the excess tension in the bottom flange is. Okay? And that's what we did here. And here you can see we used the service three limit state per ashto. But as I mentioned earlier, we said zero for tension in the bottom flange as opposed to 0.19 square root F prime C. 
So here is uh, the strands that we use based on all the testing that we did. So guaranteed ultimate tensile strength of, of a single seven wire strand is, is 60.7 kips. We used an environmental factor of 0.9. Uh, that was from an older version of, of uh, ACI 440. We don't do that anymore, or MDOT doesn't do that anymore, because we got comfortable with the fact that, so the 0.9 is there for reinforced concrete, because as Carrie said, reinforced concrete cracks. You're gonna get some sort of solution in there, you're gonna get you know, something that may affect, adversely affect carbon fiber. Pre-stressed concrete we're designing not to crack. If it cracks, you got a problem. So eventually we got comfortable with removing that 0.9 reduction factor, but at first, again, baby steps, we, uh, we used it. And then here you can see the modulus, and again, the modulus, and you heard this from Carrie, the modulus is about two-thirds that of steel, so you have to take that into account sometime. And then there was a question about coefficient of thermal expansion. What we found, and what we had to do, was we had, because, so steel and concrete, the difference is five one hundred thousandths, right? 0.00006 to 0.00065. They both expand and contract about the same time. Carbon fiber expands and contracts at a much different rate. So where we're interested in, in a pre-stressed sense, as the beam concrete, as that mass of concrete expands and contracts, I want to know the difference in force in the carbon fiber. And I need to make sure it doesn't go below what's needed under the service three limit state, but then when the beam expands, I don't want the stress to go above what we're comfortable with to stay below creep rupture. Okay, so we had to thread the needle there, and we did a lot of analysis, but so that's something, again, as practitioners, just to keep in mind. When you're dealing with, whether it's glass fiber or carbon fiber or basalt or whatever, and it's in concrete, there you, you are going to have to do some sort of analysis to look at what is your extreme contraction and expansion of that element and calculate what that change in force is in your, whether it's carbon fiber or glass fiber, and then do the check to see, is that going to matter? Okay, so that is a step that you have to do that you don't have to do with steel. Again, just running through, okay, here's, our, here's what our pre-stressing force needs to be. We know that we have a strand stress limit prior to transfer. We can calculate the number of strands and go from there. So this is what I wanted to mention about the, the, the creep rupture, okay? And I, I've got a graph that I'll show you in a little bit based on testing we did over 10 years to show what that line may look like. But you reach a point with these materials, with, with carbon fiber materials, you reach a point where under sustained load, it's going to fail, okay? If you, if you stress it high enough under that load, it's going to fail at some point during service. So the key is to stay below that. And we did a lot of testing, which I'll show you the results of. But let's build a bridge first, all right? So here's our carbon fiber strand. It shows up on reels. Now, what we had to do is we had to develop a coupling scheme. You can't just thread your carbon fiber strand through the bulkhead, couple onto it, and pull, okay? So we had to use, uh, uh, we had to couple the carbon fiber strand to the steel strand and thread the steel strand through the bulkhead and then the fabricator could just pull from there. So it's a, it's a friction coupler system where it, it puts, uh, you put a wrap around the end of the carbon fiber and then you twist down on it and then you couple that to a steel strand. The steel strand is just normal chucks and then you pull, okay? And there's a very specific way you do that, and by virtue of doing that, you're not pinching the carbon fiber, you're actually applying a force over the cross section over a length of the strand, and then pulling, okay? So you can imagine, so now we're talking about a difference in cost for the materials themselves, right? Carbon fiber costs a little more than steel. But now, the fabricator is gonna have to couple all these strands individually. What it means is their bed is tied up for 48 hours instead of 24 hours and you have to talk that through with them as they're pricing this, right? They like to flip their beds as soon as they can strip, as soon as they hit you know, their release strength, they wanna, they wanna flip the beds, that's how they make money. In this case, the fabrication takes longer and that costs a little more along with the material properties as well. So it's, a, it's an upfront cost that you have to consider, but as an owner, again, I'm thinking long-term. I'm thinking the guy that has the job after me isn't gonna have to worry about this bridge because I put carbon fiber materials in it. First one, so we put load cells uh, throughout the cross section of the beam and we compared that to the theoretical force, everything was fine. This bridge too, uh, or these beams, these beams had zero steel in them. So we used carbon fiber shear stirrups. Uh, we had to be very careful of the bend angles because there's a reduction. We also used carbon fiber mild steel throughout the beam. So these have zero steel in them. 
So here they've got the strands stressed, and now they're dropping in uh, the shear stirrups. You can see they've got the um, styrofoam core in there, and then they're putting the top reinforcement in. Beam's ready to go, casting some concrete. And then as you can see on the, uh, these photos here, completed beam, beam end looks good. No cracking, no nothing. Pulling it out of the forms. So those are the beams. On this bridge, we also used it in the bridge deck as well, and we didn't use the NEFMAC grid like we did on the previous bridge. Uh, we used the same strand that we used to pre-stress. We used that as mild reinforcement in the deck, but we still had to put a little tension in uh, just to actually keep them straight, okay? But you can see uh, we were very careful about how the iron workers treated the materials, walked on the materials, uh, but they did a really nice job. And here you can see uh, concrete placement going. And this finished bridge. These, uh, these are twin bridges. Uh, these have been uh, in service since 2014. I'm going, to, I'm going to skip past this because, again, I want, what I want to focus on here is, okay, again, the yield, there's no yield plateau, linear failure, and then we have to deal with the creep rupture. So how did we deal with the creep rupture? What is, a, what is a good amount of stress that we could put in the strand to both maximize the force that we have in the beam while staying below the creep rupture limit? We loaded some carbon fiber strands into some, some jack mechanisms uh, in 2015. And some of them are still loaded and producing strain results to this day. So we've got that many, and we, we rolled them in and out. We put them out in the wintertime, rolled them back into the lab. And from that, we were able to develop um, a graph running it out to 1 million service life hours, okay? And so you can see here, and this data, this, this graph was from 2020, but you can see here we've got some specimens loaded in there and they're rupturing you know well above what we call out in the code as you know the 0.65 or 0.7 they're rupturing at at 0 0.8 0 0.85 but from there we were able to and this is this is a uh, logarithmic line here uh, we were able to run out what do we think is going to happen at 1 million hours and then that is going to be the absolute maximum we would ever stress a carbon fiber strand okay so we have our safe zone and then we have our unsafe zone, right? And we have all the data points to prove it. So the one million hour creep stress ratio is about 84%. And again, we're backing that way down for what we actually stress these at. Okay. We're at about, you know, we're at about, back then we were doing about 64%. We've gotten a little higher, we're up to about 70% now. So there's a really nice environmental chamber at Lawrence Tech, and uh, we go a couple hundred cycles, freeze thaw, freeze thaw, freeze thaw, to see what happens. How does the carbon fiber actually behave in all of these cycles? And what we found was, depending on the resin that's used, the actual strength of the materials can even go up. Negligible, but we saw spalling in the concrete, we saw, you know, stuff you would think would happen to concrete in, in a, in a freeze-thaw cycle, but the carbon fiber did very well. So there's a discussion about heat and what does heat do to these materials, and what we found is that the carbon fiber is actually very resilient against heat. You apply your heat load, and there is no, there is no in, in the Ashto world, in the bridge world, there's no requirement for a bridge that's on fire, how long does it have to stand, right? But there is a, an ASTM for buildings, and I think it's a 45 minute something or other so that everybody can get out, right? Temperatures have to rise to 600 some degrees for 45 minutes, and that's the that's a t fact, that's how you determine the safety. And so what we found was, here's our beam, it's in the fire chamber, okay? And we actually have it loaded as well. And what we found was when the temperature reaches a certain point, about 500 degrees, the resin actually burns off. So the resin will burn, and you'll get some deflections, because as the resin burns off, the actual fibers, wherever, whatever their configuration was, they straighten out. Okay? And then the fibers themselves are highly, 
highly resistant to fire. Okay? Obviously, the bridge is going to stand. You're going to want to replace it when it's done, but it's not going to dramatically collapse. And that was something that we had no idea going in what would happen. We thought, okay, it's a brittle material. It's an oil-based material. If there's fire, it's just going to melt. And it didn't. The resin burned off, the fibers straightened out, and it held under the heat and the load. So here is our test specimen for ultimate loading. We want to load this to failure. We want to see were our assumptions correct in terms of how we proportioned the beam, how we calculated the pre-stressing force, how we did all this. And when we load it, is this thing just going to fracture in half? Or are we going to get the pseudo ductility, or the new term is deformability, that we need so that, again, as an owner, if I've got a bridge out there, I want to make sure I get a huge warning before I have to close it, right? Big deflections. So we loaded this one. This was, this was our first uh, 0.7 inch CF, CFRP pre-stressed beam. We loaded this thing to failure. You could see the strands, you know, they ruptured. But uh, you could see it for yourself. So this is a 70 foot long beam. And we ran tons of tests. We did tests to you know, load and unload and we measured cracks and this was the day that we loaded it to failure. You hear the strands starting to pop, but it's still holding. all the deflection that we had in the beam prior to failure. Look at that. We all like breaking stuff, right? So it deflected 18 and a half inches on a 70 foot span. That's, that's plenty of warning, okay? All right, so that's the pre-stressing. Last thing I wanna talk about then is repairing existing structures, okay? That's why it's, it's, it's so important, again, for me as, as a former owner to have a good specification for FRP repairs, okay? So we have a huge bridge. The largest bridge in the state of Michigan is I-75 over the Rouge River. It's uh, 1.5 million square foot of bridge deck. Um, 250 spans, okay? tons and tons and tons of columns that were built in an era where the MDOT specifications allowed the use of slag aggregate in structural concrete, which we don't anymore. Slag aggregate is a byproduct of um, you know, blast furnace slag and stuff. There's, you know, Detroit's the Motor City, Ford Motor Company. Uh, back in the 70s, there was, we tried to be environmentally responsible in using some of that byproduct in our concretes, and then we found out less in the service life of our concrete. Anyways, so we have this massive bridge out there that has 800 some piers that are loaded with slag aggregate and some of the piers are 120 feet tall and it's an entire maintenance program just to maintain them because to replace that bridge right now would probably cost in the vicinity of 300 to 400 million dollars. And the bridge is about, it was opened in 1967, so the bridge is only 60 years old, got to get some more life out of it. So we've got to keep it going for a number of years. So as the columns deteriorate, we put together a program where we would repair them with you know, chipping, patching, and then an FRP wrap. So we wrote a specification. We worked with some uh, manufacturers in Michigan, and uh, we started with the Caltrans spec, which was, which was really, really good. Here's a little blurb on the uh, slag aggregate. Again, it, it's part of a byproduct of the steel industry. It almost looks like popcorn. 
It has zero fracture resistance. So if a crack is coming through, it's just going to, it's not going to stop there. It's just going to crack right through. So you could see how that could be a durability requirement in structural concrete. Okay. So here's some of our columns that we've prepared. We've saw cut and, and chipped, added some galvanic anodes, help with, you know, help with some of the future corrosion, and just some strips of zinc in there. And then we overcast some concrete, and then we wrap it. And these wraps are, like I said, it, it, in my mind as, an, as a former owner, they're a game changer for me. Uh, a couple of things you have to be cautious of. These are square columns. You actually have to round the, the chamfers of the columns. You have to actually put a nice radius in. Otherwise, you'll create stress concentrations in the wrap. Surface preparation is key. You can't put the wraps on until the concrete is at, is at least reached 28 day compressive strength and then you still want to let it cure a little bit more um, and then you want to sandblast it to uh, SSPC you know, uh, 3. So here's the wraps going in. Again, you can see how tall some of these columns are. And the other thing about carbon fiber is uh, it is uh, susceptible to UV degradation. So simple, you just put a coating on that and uh, good to go. So this is how we're maintaining the, one of the biggest bridges in the state of Michigan. Okay. Last thing I want to show you is we did the theoretical design, we did all the laboratory work, now let's tie it all together with an in-the-field load test. The longest bridge that we've designed to date with carbon fiber is we did a 140-foot long single-span pre-stressed I-beam bridge, 72-inch deep girders. Okay. So we did a modeling program because we wanted to do a load test. So during the design, uh, when we were putting, when we were designing the bridge, and I'm going to go through some of this quickly here, just camber. So here's our cross section. We wanted to do some finite element analysis with the trucks along the cross section to see what the resulting strains and deflections in these carbon fiber pre-stressed beams would be. Okay? So we selected these beams, A, D, and G, put some deflection targets on it, had some of our winter maintenance vehicles fully loaded with sand, and then from a theoretical sense, we started analyzing. We put a truck on the cross section. What happens from a theoretical perspective? Okay? And again, we move them all around. So here we are conducting the test in the field. This is before we open the bridge. So the bridge is built before we opened it. Run the trucks across. Here's two trucks. Two trucks in separate lanes. Running across the cross section until we get to the other side. Then one truck. And then we did an extreme case where we had two trucks back to back. Okay. So here in the results, the upper line is the actual field measurements. And the lower line is the theoretical calculated elements. Okay, so here you can see for the single truck, two trucks going across the cross section now. I had a data point issue there, but still it's okay. But you can see that the performance is actually. The actual performance is greater, is better, you know, better than the theoretical. And in terms of stresses in the beams, again, nothing, nothing that was uh, alarming in terms of tension with these trucks on the span. Okay, and so that was how we tied it all together. So we went through, you know, the baby steps in the mid-2000s and did a lot of research and did the applications out slower and slower and slower until we got to a point where we built a 140-foot long single-span bridge, did a load test, tie all that together, and now uh, when, when I left the Michigan DOT, we had done about 13 pre uh, CFRP pre-stress bridges. We have a regular uh, FRP uh, repair program like the one you saw in Rouge River. and. Um, Hope to do more in the future. So with that, I'll take questions. I was just asking if uh, you have considered using FRP in the uh, barriers 
or a medium. I seen you just only uh, for the bridge deck, bridge beam. How about some, um, you know, barrier or uh, back wall? Any other applications? Yeah. So the barrier discussion is is an interesting one, and it's been it's been going on in Ashto right now. So the barrier on a bridge has to meet mash requirements, right? And there's only a few ways that you can get a MASH certification. You can have an FHWA letter, or you can have crash test results. That's pretty much it right now. Back in the old LFD, with your, uh, your type, your TL1 through 6, you could do a static load analysis and show that whether it's steel that connects the bridge deck to the barrier, or carbon fiber, or whatever, you could do a static load analysis, and that would be good enough. That is not good enough anymore. It's either a certification letter or a crash test. And crash testing is expensive. So on, the, on that bridge that we showed where we used FRP in the bridge deck, we used it in the barrier. But the connection of the barrier to the deck, right, those hook bars that go in, those were steel. So that's a problem that we're still trying to solve in terms of having the connection of the barrier to the bridge deck be something other than steel. Uh, we just, we, we're still working on it. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a quick question on FRP wraps that you have used for column. Do you think that works for the seismic application as well? Or, uh, and circular uh, columns that's more common in the, maybe, in the bridges? Yeah, so Michigan is its own one, so we never have to deal with seismic. Um, all of our calculations were based on confinement and increased axial capacity. Mm -hmm. There was never a consideration for any type of recentering or anything that's required. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know in, in Caltrans, I know that they have, you know, Jim Gutierrez, is, who's their awesome carbon fiber guy out there, he's been pushing for, for more of that, but I, I lost track of where that is. I do not know how that would work in seismic. And about that FE models, you have a lot of difference between the field test and your models, right? Do you know why we get that difference? Uh, yeah, so great question. So the, um, whenever you're dealing with a theoretical versus actual, there's things on the theoretical side we throw out, right? So for example, uh, the stiffness of the barrier, right? We know that when you load a bridge, if you've got like a GM style barrier or whatever, that barrier is going to resist. It's going to go into compression. It's above the neutral axis, going into compression, right? The other thing, too, is in the finite model, we're assuming 5,500 PSI concrete, whereas fabricator may have produced beams that were 7,500, right? All we care about is it greater than the design strength at 28 days. If it goes all the way up to 10,000 after 156 days, who cares, right? So those are the subtle differences in what would be the actual conditions versus theoretical. So for, for the pictures of uh, the bridge that you showed with carbon fiber strap, uh, did you guys use wet layup or dry layup? Uh, wet layup. We have a provision for both, but that was wet layup. Uh, why? We, so it was mainly the manufacturer. So we're, okay. Michi you know, we do everything low bid. So the contractor selected a, a, a One manufacturer, of the manufacturer that, that was on our pre-qualified list. Yep. Uh, and the other question is, do you see a lot of use for the uh, uh, laminate carbon fiber in the North American market? Like the solid ones underneath, or it's more like fabric and sheets? Uh, I see both. Uh, we, we, I've used the laminates. Uh, we had a culvert uh, project where the culvert joints were separating. And so we cut some grooves in and put the laminates in to hold the joints together. Um, so I see use for both. Um, Al Erickson, AIT Composites. Um, two questions. I noticed you're using uh, uh, like all carbon fiber, even in the reinforcing in the decks and whatnot. Have you done things where you use the CFRP strands, but then use GFRP, BFRP in the decks because the CFRP is expensive? Correct. No, no, we have not, or Michigan has not. There should be no reason why not. There's no. We have a we have a GFRP spec. We actually have a GFRP and a BFRP spec. Because there's manufacturers in northern Michigan, right? And we wanted, uh, we wrote a special provision that actually would allow contractors to swap it out. Mm -hmm. A couple years ago, when steel prices were skyrocketing all over, we put a special provision in projects that would allow the contractor to swap it out, um, and they did several times. All right. But we never used; it was never glass; it was always basalt. Basalt. Yeah. Right. Very good. And another th question, second question on the fire test you did. 
Uh, was that uh, beam that was in there, was that entirely inside the fire chamber or were there cool zones on either side at Barron? No, it was entirely in the fire chamber and the video you saw was actually from a portal that we put the camera and right. you could only hold the camera there for a few seconds before the lens actually started to melt. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your great presentation. My name is Tomohiro Miki from Kobe uh, University, Japan. I have two questions. First one is that do you have any the measurement in the field for the, the uh, pre uh, pretensioning uh, beam, the development length on the each end of the, the beam, uh, each anchor's area? And the uh, second question is, uh, can I go well, no, I, so for the first question, you're talking about how far we're anchoring, yes. like so when we pre-stress? Yeah, pre-stress, uh, stress transfer region, each end. So, yeah, the stress transfer region is, is just, just like traditional. Okay. So whether it's steel or carbon fiber, uh, that stress transfer length, uh, there's, there's equations that we use in the first, you know, in, at the tenth points of the beam. Okay, so that is, is there any measurement for the, the actual beam? Uh, no, it's just all based on elongations. I see. Okay. Elongation of the actual strand to reach the, the jacking force. Okay. Second question is the creep. But the creep on the, the, the bond property between the concrete and the uh, FRP. Do you have any the measurement for long term creep on bond? And also, the, is there any the temperature the measurement for the, this kind of the, the bond property? Because I, I want to use for that for the, the not only the casting place, but also pre casting. Mm -hmm. So in that case, that is one of the problem during the, uh, not only the curing, on, I mean the steam curing, but also the long-term durability. So do you have any uh, information about that? So for bond, um, and there's bond fatigue, and there's all those long-term things that you have to take into account, right? So uh, we didn't have a requirement at the time, and it just kind of naturally came out. So on glass fiber bar, they put some, you know, sand or whatever, right, to help with that bond. Uh, for the carbon fiber, at least what Tokyo Rope did at the time, was they came up with this, they, they did a transverse wrap yes. that created friction between the concrete and the, and the strand, and that solved all of the bond problems. We, we made cubes and we pulled and we did shear tests and everything, and it, it, the bond was fine. Okay, because I'm working with the Tokyo Rope on that uh, pro uh, property or measurement, okay. so I want to share with you. Yeah, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll tend to make that somewhat proprietary because it's part of their manufacturing process. But we did all the tests and it performed just fine. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Very educational, informational. I'm not a British person, but I do get involved in forensic investigation and repair recommendations for conventional concrete structures like parking structures. Um, my question to you is about the uh, deflection of a beam. Mm -hmm. Would you use uh, FRP for controlling the deflection of a beam? No. Uh, the, so for deflection, and you saw how much that deflected, FRP, because of its lower modulus, it's going to deflect more at the same strain. As, so if you have a steel bar at 0 .005 strain and a FRP bar of the same cross section at 0 .005 strain, same loading, the FRP bar is going to deflect more because the modulus is about two thirds. Yeah. So it's not something that would be used for deflection control. It's something that can be used for strengthening, which will help with deflection, but it wouldn't be something that I would use for deflection control. If you, if you use it as a wrap around a beam, mm -hmm. would that help or would it still not be helpful? Uh, no, the, the deflection is going to be, for a beam, the deflection is going to be a function of its moment of inertia and, and, you know, and its modulus. The FRP that's on it would not be included in any deflection calculations, just strength. So a steel plate under the beam would be more useful than FRP. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what you can do, if you're talking about strengthening applications, it's a lot of effort, but you could prop up prior to installation of the longitudinal FRP so that it starts to take some of the dead load component. Yeah. You've got to be careful of those creep rupture limits. But um, you can do things as part of the retrofit where even a, a thin layer of FRP tension base uh, can help with long-term deflections. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, so you could pre-camber it, yeah. put your FRP on, 
and then as it wants to dead load camber, that FRP is going to go into tension and it will help. You're, yeah, you're right. I'd like to thank again Matt for a wonderful presentation. Thank and you.